All right, folks, after lunch, and we're back. So I've got Dr. McDonald here ready and waiting for you. Uh, if anybody has any questions of me, I'll just say that out right now. Just go ahead and put them in the chat box on YouTube. We'll address those as we see them, if you have any. If you don't, that's fine. So I'm going to basically shut up for the moment and hand it over to Dr. McDonald. There you go. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to start out with what's going on here. Uh, you're called to the scene for a disturbance. The police department is on scene requesting. They've got a 30-year-old male. He was acting erratic, sweating profusely, really don't know anything else. They've cleared the scene for you to come in. So you get on scene, um, they're already there. They have called. They were called for a person that was causing a disturbance in the neighborhood. Uh, this is not an uncommon instance for EMS providers. They found the individual running from yard to yard. He was screaming obscenities, flailing, not really responding to any of their commands. Uh, when you get there, they have him secured. There's a couple of officers holding him down. He's, he's face down, he's yelling, he's screaming. Uh, the officers told you it took several of them to, to get him under control. He's handcuffed. He appears diaphoretic. He's really incoherent, not really responding to anything appropriately. No one on scene knows him. No, nobody knows any history. He doesn't really respond to any questions. He's just screaming, help me, help me, thrashing around on the ground. The officers are requesting medications to help calm him down. So while you're on scene, trying to get some information, trying to figure out what's going on, he's becoming less and less coherent. Guess what? Now he's unresponsive. As we know how this goes, he's not breathing now. And now he doesn't have a pulse. So now you begin resuscitation. He's in PEA. You continue to work him, intubate him, IVs, do all the appropriate things. He continues to remain in PEA until you arrive at the emergency department. So what exactly happened? This is this has uh, been seen several times. This has been well documented. So what really went on with this individual? So today we're going to talk a little bit about something called excited delirium syndrome. We're going to go through this um, in a little bit more detail. This is somewhat controversial. So uh, as far as disclaimers, I don't really have any. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I actually began my career in 1993. Yes, I'm old. I don't want to hear anything in the comments. As a monitor tech in the ICU, um, I began my EMS career in 1995. I started out as a dispatcher, as an EMT. Then I went to uh, working on the ambulance. I went to paramedic school. I've worked in both rural and metropolitan EMS systems. I worked in southwest Oklahoma for a number of years. Uh, we did a lot of long-distance transport, so I feel your pain. Newton County and Mets, I really feel your pain when we call you all the time. Uh, I worked from 2000 to 2010 uh, for the Emergency Medical Services Authority in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I uh, covered a large populous area. Uh, I was a paramedic and I was a field training officer. I went to clinical services coordinator and field operations supervisor. Uh, I was responsible for training EMTs and paramedics. Field training officers, I worked with both the Oklahoma City and Tulsa operations. Um, I graduated medical school in 2011 uh, from the uh, Oklahoma State University. And then I graduated emergency medicine residency from Freeman here in Joplin in 2015. So now you know a little bit more about me. And when you see my scowl in the emergency department, you'll understand I've been there. So, <clears throat> a little bit of humor for you. So excited delirium, what exactly is it? Does it really exist? We're going to talk a little bit about the American College of Emergency Physicians white paper from 2009. So the term excited delirium has been used to, as a subcategory for delirium, is primary, primarily been described retrospectively. Most often they describe it in post-mortem. 
It's been more recently brought forward in the 2000s, 2009, 2010, um, and the AC, ACEP generated what they determined was a, what they called as a white paper. It was a consensus of professionals um, and a consensus of experts. They put together a task force and they determined that the excited delirium syndrome is a unique syndrome which can be identified by the presence of a distinct group of clinical and behavioral characteristics that can be recognized actually in the pre-mortem state. Again, before, they'd always describe this in the post-mortem state. It's potentially fatal, but if we, get, if we intervene early, we can actually prevent death in some of these cases. Some of these cases, patients are just going to die. It's just going to happen. Patients die. Unfortunately, we deal with that on a daily basis. So, <clears throat> again, it was primarily described in the postmortem by, by pathologists and medical examiners. Um, it's made its way uh, into police, EMS, and in the emergency department and medical legal uh, literature. Now, it has this terminology of excited delirium syndrome. Uh, so it's a spectrum of behaviors and signs that actually look like other medical problems. There is somewhat of an overlap between this and psychiatric illnesses that we'll kind of discuss in a little bit. A little bit of history. There have been about a there have been case reports for over 150 years of this syndrome, but they never really described it. They didn't use the terminology excited delirium. They just described the symptoms and the features. Historically, it began in institutions, and they were initially discussed, the clinical behavior and outcomes were very similar to what we see today in these patients in these institutions. It was initially called Bell's Mania. Dr. Luther Bell is a primary psychiatrist at the McLean Asylum for the Insane in Massachusetts. First described it uh, as a clinical condition that took the lives of about 75% of patients. Uh, during this time, patients with mental illness were placed in these insane asylums and have a very high mortality rate. And then all of a sudden, in the 1940s and 1950s, it suddenly declined, and I want you guys to kind of post in the chat, why do you think it declined during that time? And I'll give just a couple minutes here for, see if somebody gives us a response. There is a slight delay between your broadcast and the headache. Mm-hmm. Answers are pouring in. I can feel it. So, in the 1950s, there was the advent of... Go back one. In the 1950s, there was the advent of antipsychotic medications. This is when they began to see a marked decline in this mania that they were seeing in these institutions. There was also the de I can't even say that word. They took the people out of these institutions, um, began placing them into normal community settings, treating them with medications, and they began seeing improvement. And again, this Bell's mania and the 75% mortality went away. Fast forward a few years, the 1980s, Dr. Reagan was, Dr. Reagan, President Reagan was there, the movies were cheesy, the style was, yeah, it was something, you can see the picture, uh, but what else happened? In around 1985, there was a marked increase in this abnormal behavior. We started seeing these patients show up in the emergency department, uncontrolled psychiatric emergencies. 
So most of them were found to be caused by, at the time we thought was cocaine. In 1985, there was a subset of cocaine deaths that were described by Whitley and Fishbane in a seminal paper. And the first time this term excited delirium was used. Typical course uh, of the excited delirium, the patient's had this acute drug intoxication. They often had a history of mental illness, um, especially paranoia. There was a struggle with law enforcement, uh, some sort of noxious or chemical um, restraint was used, or the electrical control device such as the tasers. Tasers were blamed for a period of time and numerous deaths in these patients. They had this sudden unexpected death. The autopsy could not really find a good cause of death. So the problem with this syndrome is there's no ICD-10 code. There's no DSM-4 diagnosis, and the American Medical Association does not recognize this syndrome. This is where it becomes a real sticking point in medicine because these things are not coded. The medical legal people have it as a convenient term. They see it as an excuse to exonerate uh, authorities when someone dies in their custody. So they feel like this is a manufactured term for law enforcement cons conspiracies or cover-up for brutality, which Having dealt with these patients, and I know you guys have seen these patients, we know that so that's not the case with this often. Really, the number of instances is really difficult to determine how many times this occurs. There's no current standardized case definition. We know that there's stimulant use typically involved. It's most often cocaine. Around here, we see methamphetamine. Occasionally, we'll see PCP. Um, observational studies have shown that the incidence of death among patients that are manifesting the signs and symptoms consistent with it is about 8.3%. All of them are using some sort of substance, cocaine, methamphetamine, and again, cocaine is the most common. Bath salts would be another one, and it, we had a rash of that um, back in the uh, 2011, 12, 13. We had a huge rash of bath salts. And again, they had these very similar symptoms, um, diaphoretic, tachycardic, just out of their mind. So bath salts would fall in that as well. So who's going to develop this? How can we predict which patients are going to develop this excited delirium syndrome. Well, about 95% of the published fatal cases fit a definitive profile. They're typically male. They're typically in their mid-30s. They're obese, and again, the stimulant use is present most often cocaine, but again, meth, PCP, LSD, and we can throw the bath salts into that. They have this typical course that they follow. They're hyper-aggressive, they are bizarre in their behavior, impervious to pain. No matter what happens, they keep going. These are the patients that are hit with a taser several times and still won't go down. They're extremely combative. Multiple people to try to control this. There's generally a struggle with law enforcement that typically the physical restraint or they uh, try pepper spray or, again, the um, electrical control device or the taser they're hyperthermic, they're tachycardic, they have this, this fight, 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 and then they start becoming more and more somnolent, and then ultimately they have this period of sudden death. The other things we also need to think about is the psychiatric component of this. 
Psychiatric illnesses comply, comprise the second largest group that this does happen in. Um, and typically this is due to an abrupt cessation of their antipsychotic medications. Again, these people often require the use of force, physical restraint, taser deployment, chemical restraint. Um, and they can prevent very similarly. Medication noncompliance is really common in the psychiatric population. We know this. Um, but we also have to think about, is this patient acutely psychotic? Are they off their antipsychotic medications? Do they have a new psychiatric illness? Uh, typically, we see new onset psychiatric illness in, in, the, in the early 20s to mid 20s. Um, and they have these mania and these, these psychotic episodes. And sometimes they can present with this excited delirium as well. So there was some information recorded from about two years from the Canadian police. There was over a million police and public interactions. They found 698 encounters that involved the use of force. They were able to identify 24 cases that fit the excited delirium syndrome six of the six of ten potential clinical criteria were identified so in looking at this a million encounters that's a ton of police encounters with people of those set of those million encounters 700 required the use of force that's not that many 24 of those fit the criteria for excited delirium so they were able to extrapolate some data from that of clinical criteria, some criteria that they noticed with all of these patients of the 24 of patients with the excited delirium with a 95% confidence interval that this is going to be seen. Pain intolerance, they're tachypnic, they're sweating, they're agitated, they have this tactile hyperthermia, they feel very hot to the touch. Police noncompliance, they just keep going and going. They don't, they don't get tired. They will fight off six, eight individuals. Often they're inappropriately clothed or stripping down. Uh, they did mention this mirror or glass attraction where they would just stare at themselves at the mirror or bang on the glass. That was really infrequent. But all of the other things you can see, these patients fit a specific profile. The problem with it is it's still, it's really complex. It's really poorly understood. Um, there are a lot of underlying associated causes, psychiatric disease, psychiatric drug withdrawal, metabolic disorders, things that we need to think about. Again, cocaine was the most common in the, but in the postmortem toxicology evaluation, um, the concentrations of cocaine were actually really similar to just a recreational cocaine user. Um, and it was actually less than acute intoxication deaths from cocaine. But what they did find was on postmortem brain examination and, and, and histostaining, they found that there was a downregulation and loss of dopamine transporters in, the spe in a specific area of the brain called the striatum. So what they think is occurring is that there's an excess of dopamine stimulation. Um, their uh, dopamine receptors in the hypothalamus, which are responsible for thermoregulation. So if you don't have those dopamine receptors, you get this overwhelming surge of dopamine in the hypothalamus, which would then causes you to be severely hyperthermic, um, and you get this manic event as well. Uh, the most common cardiac rhythm that was associated with it uh, was bradyasystole. Ventricular dysrhythmias were actually pretty rare. Um, it's actually only occurred in one patient uh, in the patients that they identified. Um, the majority actually die very shortly after this violent struggle. They have a severe acidosis um, and that probably plays a large role in the lethality of this um, and also the associated cardiovascular collapse. And I know this is the way a lot of us feel currently, but keep doing what you do. It's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. <laughs> so the typical progression of things 
You get a call for a person acting strange or violent or erratic. Again, it's the, the male in the mid-30s, not responding to commands, trying to get them to comply verbally. They will not uh, begin attempts at physical restraint or taser deployment. No response, no response to pain. They have this remarkable physical strength. They're sweating profusely. They feel hot. They're continuing to fight. They get restrained. They get handcuffed. Their mental state gradually declines, and they go into cardiac arrest, and we can't get them back. And, and again, all of the data shows that these are the mid-30-year-old males. So things that are important to EMS, things that are important to law enforcement, is we need to be able to recognize this state. Um, but also recognize that this is actually an acute medical emergency. They're going to be impervious to pain. They're often going to be irrational. Um, normal measures are not going to work. And law enforcement needs to know that, hey, we probably need to call EMS. And you guys need to be aware of the violent, possible violent situation, the amount of restraint it's going to take to hold these people down. Um, so they need to be able to take this patient into custody quickly. Um, and then get care turned over to EMS when they arrive. Uh, some of this goes back to, and I know the law enforcement guys get training on the excited delirium syndrome. They need to be able to recognize which patients are potentially going to fall into this category. They feel hot. They feel sweaty. They need to call EMS. Okay, for you guys, you need to be getting clues from the dispatch call. And I know uh, at times that's difficult, but attempting to get some more information before you get on scene would be very helpful to you. Uh, recognize the signs and symptoms and know that when death occurs, it's quick. And it's typically following a, a, a struggle. Um, and it's very, very difficult to get these guys back during resuscitation. Again, this is the same thing over and over again of the erratic behavior, psychostimulant use, or psychiatric illness, nudity, improperly clothed. Uh, hopefully you guys are kind of getting that beat into your head of what to look for. Um, The, th the things that we need to think about are the AEIOU TIPS or SMASHED um, acronyms, okay? The differential diagnosis, alcohol, in alcohol endocrine encephalop en encephalopathy. Does this patient have an acute septic illness causing them, causing this weird encephalopathy? Do they have a history of alcohol abuse? Electrolyte disturbances, are they hypoglycemic, the great mimic? One of my biggest complaints against EMS is an inappropriate blood sugar. Um, check your blood sugar on everybody. If you start an IV, check a blood sugar. It's not that hard, um, and that can clue you in. Make sure that your blood glucose monitors are calibrated. Um, that's another big thing. Get a blood sugar, you get 120, and they show up at the hospital and their blood sugar is 30. So make sure that your blood glucose monitors are appropriately calibrated. Don't forget about hypoxia. Hypoxic patients will be out of their head. They can be combative. They can be tachycardic. They can be uh, diaphoretic. Opiates, uh, typically they're not really fighting a lot, but that may be one reason that somebody's altered. Um, uremia, uh, patients in kidney failure. Uh, toxins, multiple toxins. There's too many to list, but some of the ones that you guys do need to think about that can cause some of these same symptoms. Benadryl, a Benadryl overdose. Um, tricyclic antidepressants, Flexeril. Some of these medications and overdose can cause some of these exact same symptoms. Those are some of the common ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Don't forget about Tylenol PM. Tylenol PM is basically Benadryl and Tylenol. So 
with Benadryl, you can get this same thing. They're hot, they're tachycardic, they're goofy. <clears throat> they're acting out of their head. Again, infection, uh, and always psychiatric. Uh, there's another one listed that you guys will never diagnose. I've been trying to diagnose for years. It's called porphyria. Um, you guys won't diagnose that. <laughs> Stroke, uh, again, shock. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, or space-occupying lesions. Um, patients that present with a new onset of acute psychosis can actually have uh, a CNS lesion. The smashed is the substrates such as glucose, thiamine deficiency, sepsis, meningitis, mental illness, alcohol, accident, again, trauma, CVA, intracranial hemorrhage, seizures, uh, stimulants, hallucinogenics, and anticholinergics. Again, that goes back to the Benadryl, the TCAs, Flexeril, or your anticholinergics. Um, hyperthermia, <clears throat> hyperthyroidism, um, a thyroid storm will present also very similarly to this. Patients will be tachycardic. They can be emotionally labile. They can be acutely psychotic. Um, they can be uh, hypertensive. All of the things that you can see with this, you will see with a, hy with a uh, hyperthyroidism or a thyroid storm. Uh, a lot of times you'll see atrial fibrillation uh, with, with RVR in those types of patients as well. Um, Another thing to think about with altered mental status is hypotension, hypothyroidism, hypoxia, hypothermia, again, your electrolytes and drugs. Please don't forget about the great mimic. Um, I've seen several patients having a stroke, and turns out their blood sugar's 20. So don't forget blood glucose. Heat stroke, you can also, again, with heat stroke, have tactile hyperthermia. They can develop rhabdo. Uh, they, will, they can also have delirium. Um, and this can also be, you can see this in um, psychiatric patients as well. They can have this neural, uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome that can be hyperthermic. Serotonin syndrome. A lot of times with serotonin syndrome, they, they may be somewhat altered, but they, they won't be hot to the touch, diaphoretic, things like that. You'll see that more with neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which can occur with patients taking antipsychotics. Um, Zyprexa, Geodon, things like that. Typically, they're not aggressive. Now, everybody's different, but typically you don't see that aggressive behavior. Um, and sometimes they are a little bit more directable than the patients with excited delirium. Uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about this Phillips versus Milwaukee. Um, so they called this patient excited delirium but when they got to autopsy this patient died in police custody what they discovered was that he had an untreated thyrotoxicosis he had severe hyperthyroidism so he was non-compliant with his thyroid medicines on top of being non-compliant with his antipsychotics so it's not just the stimulants you have to worry about, it's everything else. This is what makes emergency medicine fun. And as we are today, I'm stuck in a room. And, and can you still, can you get regular sick or is everything corona today? <laughs> or the excited delirium patient has corona. That's right. <laughs> Undiagnosed Corona. That's what it is. That's why they're fighting the cops. Stabbed with the stabbed in the brain with a swab. Good one. Yeah. So, treatment is largely speculative and consensus driven, and what that means is we're doing the best we can with what we've got. Um, so right now, the ACEP, based upon their white paper, and the white paper is old. It's from two thousand nine. So it's almost 2021, um, but there's not been another consensus statement made on excited delirium. So from what we know and what we know works best with these patients is aggressive chemical sedation. Um, the physical struggle is a much greater contributor to catecholamine surge and metabolic acidosis. So these patients have this 
more and more and more. They fight, they fight, they fight, they fight. They develop rhabdo, and all of a sudden, now they're severely acidotic. They go into cardiac arrest, and you can't get them back. So you want to minimize the time spent fighting these patients or struggling with these patients. Utilize as much personnel as you need to that's got appropriate training, safe physical control measures, not laying on somebody's chest. Um, when I first started in EMS, the training for the combative psychotic patient was to put the fa patient face down on the cot with a scoop stretcher strapped across the back of them. We found out that probably wasn't a good idea. So when they arrested, it was tough to get them out of the scoop stretcher. So keep that in mind. Use safe physical control measures. Um, get vital signs if at all possible. I know how difficult that can be with these patients. Cardiac monitoring is a must um, because they can die quickly. Uh, IV access, check your blood glucose. A pulse ox, supplemental O2 if their O2 sets are less than 95 or 90. Um, IV medications are preferred, but again, we know what it's like fighting these patients, and sometimes you get what you get and you don't throw a fit, so they get IM. Um, you can also use intranasal. Everybody forgets about intranasal medications. Um, do you guys still carry the atomizers? Yes. So don't forget you've got nasal atomizers on the ambulance. Versed can be given intranasally. Um, I'm not sure about ketamine. I believe it can, but I'd have to double check. Um, it can, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, water soluble, so it can be given intranasal. Um, may not be quite as effective. I know Versed is very effective intranasal, um, but if you can't get that, I am. Benzos, benzos, benzos. You guys don't carry antipsychotics. Uh, the next best thing that you carry is ketamine. But we have to be careful with ketamine. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. We've got to be real careful with ketamine. But Versed can be given intranasally as well, and it works very well. Um, but it's probably going to take more than the 5 milligrams you're allowed to give. You may have to call for more. Um, if you're fighting somebody and you call me in the ER, um, I'm probably going to tell you to innovate them. And don't forget you have that option. Um, but, you know, be dang sure that you can do it. But you can also um, sedate them, paralyze them, and intubate them. It's uh, safer for the patient and safer for you in the back of the ambulance trying, versus trying to fight them. Ketamine. Ketamine is a disassociative hypnotic. It actually works pretty quickly, I am. Um, it does have some rare side effects. Uh, laryngospasm is a big one. And this is a puckering moment uh, when your patient all of a sudden can't breathe because you've slammed ketamine to them. It can cause hypertension, and it does cause tachycardia, um, which, again, this is where we have to be really careful with ketamine. The emergence phenomenon can happen. Um, it's, this is more common in kids. Uh, I've seen it a couple of times in adults. Uh, typically, you can control it with benzos, but the emergence phenomenon we typically more see in kids. Um, but, again, you have to be careful with ketamine. Because of the side effects, the hypertension, it does cause tachycardia, um, you can actually overdose a patient on ketamine, which I didn't know was possible because we've had accidents, not here at this facility, but I've talked to some other physicians that um, wrong dose was given to a pediatric patient. The kid was given 10 times their dose, um, and they slept for several hours, like 24, but they were fine. Um, Elijah McLean, uh, this name was in the news within the past couple of years, I believe. Uh, it's happened in Colorado. Uh, there was a struggle with the police department. Um, the police department was re requesting give him ketamine, give him ketamine, give him ketamine. Uh, and he got a large dose of ketamine. Reportedly, he got one and a half times what he should have. He got 500 milligrams IM. Um, so you have to be very careful and, and, and make sure you're giving the appropriate dose. Most patients will respond to 200 milligrams pretty readily. Um, it will calm them down enough. 
Uh, there are rare instances where you have to go up to that 400. Um, I know the IV dosing is typically one to two milligrams IV uh, for control and the IM dose, if we're doing sedation, is uh, about four milligrams per kilo. Hopefully we're not approaching that. Looking at some of the recent data, there were 902 reported instances in Colorado of paramedics administering ketamine between 2018 and 2020. And about 17% of those had complications. So out of the 900, put my phone. Roughly 90 of those, 95 of those, had a complication from ketamine use. Uh, that includes cardiac arrest, oxygen deprivation were the two big ones. So you have to be careful, make sure you're administering the appropriate dose. With the hyperthermia, again, you want to begin basic cooling measures. Um, kind of most often they're stripped down anyway, uh, but you can have a fan blowing on them. And then you can begin active cooling measures as they feel very hot to the touch, pack them ice, ice packs to the groin axilla, spraying with cool mist. The acidosis, you're not going to be able to do a whole lot about this in the field. Again, IV fluid hydration, um, start them on fluids. Uh, again, the hyperventilation is, is really common with these patients. And if you do end up having to intubate them, you want to try to match their respiratory rate because a lot of times they're hyperventilating to help blow off. Uh, they're trying to compensate for the acidosis that's occurring. The acidosis is, is from them fighting, rhabdo, there are multiple different causes. And again, with ketamine, we have to be careful because it can cause increased tachycardia um, and hypertension. So I'm going to play a little video here to kind of show what it actually looks like. Hopefully this video comes across. Um, it has a big uh, uh, WW thing across the middle. Um, so I kind of appropriated this from... So if you guys heard that as a white male, no shirt. And as you can see, guys, non compliant. You can see he looks very sweaty. So you heard him call for EMS right then. 
Now you can see they're tying something to his legs. Uh, this is not really done or taught by law enforcement anymore. Now you notice what's happening now. It was kind of starting to settle down a little bit. Notice he's not really fighting a whole lot anymore. Again, law enforcement doesn't typically hobble patients anymore. And now we're not fighting. Yeah. 
can't tell, so I can my, my heart's about to hurry up, so I can't tell this. So you guys can see how quickly that went downhill. Um, I can imagine the police officers panic when they recognize the individual is now unresponsive. Uh, and they're wanting nothing more than for EMS to be there. So, again, be vigilant. Watch for the signs. Try to get as much history while you're in route as possible. Do what you can to keep your crew safe. Um, let the guys that have the guns and the badge fight people. Um, but be aware that when you get called in, you're, you may have to deal with this. Don't forget the medications that you have at your disposal to help manage these patients, manage them more appropriately. Benzodiazepines will be your friend. Uh, Versed, uh, I know both services uh, and most of the services around here carry Versed. Um, you also have ketamine, but again, you want to be careful, make sure you're dosing it appropriately. Make sure you get good IV access, get IV fluids, um, and begin trying to cool them if they're that hyperthermic state. And be aware of the imminent rapid cardiac arrest and be prepared to act. So uh, hopefully you guys learned a little bit of something. Um, the biggest resource I used was the ACEP white paper, a um, little bit of Google for videos, uh, and some of the other uh, news information and statistics. Um, and be vigilant, wash your hands, wear your mask, don't cough on people, don't try to, you know, do things to get everybody else sick. I appreciate you guys, appreciate you what you do. Um, if you have any questions, catch me in the ER, type them out here for these guys. Um, we'll give you a little bit of time here for any quick questions that you may have. But that's it for my presentation, and again, hopefully you learned a little something. Now there's a little bit of a lag, so I'm waiting. Thank you. 
All right. Well, if you guys don't have any questions, um, we'll catch you next time. Uh, and let us know how the residents are doing on their presentations as well. Um, we need feedback on them because this is part of their education as well as is teaching and training other individuals. So I need feedback on them and how they do. So uh, catch myself, Dr. Wright, Dr. Grounds, Dr. Kennedy, Dr. Brown, or Dr. Mahirin. Uh, let us know how they did. Um, just, hey, they did a great job, or, hey, we could have used a little bit more information on this. Just something so I can give those guys some feedback. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks. All right, everybody, as we switch out speakers here, let's take a break. I'm just going to go ahead and sign out the live stream. Uh, give me about uh, 15 minutes or so, and we'll sign back in. Thanks, you